Greetings and salutations, good people of War Room Nation. We'd like to invite you guys to sit back and listen to episode number 241 of The War Room. In this episode, we talk about the deaths that rocked the sports world this week. Dean Smith, Ed Sable, Jerry Tarkanian, three absolute icons in the sports world who all passed away this week. We also talk about the controversy that's gripping Little League Baseball as Jackie Robinson West, the all-black team from Chicago, has been stripped of their Little League World Series U.S. title amidst allegations of boundary fraud. Uh, We also talk a lot of basketball because it is NBA All-Star Weekend. To help us do that is Kamal Hilton, NBA writer for War Room Sports and NBA Nation Australia, who comes with us to talk about his observations from the first half of the season as well as his expectations for the second half of the season. And of course, since it is All-Star Weekend, we give you guys all of our picks for all the All-Star Weekend events. So sit back, relax, enjoy yourself, grab some popcorn, grab a a drink, and listen to episode number 241 of The War Room, which starts right now. Blog Talk Radio. Go and get your shine box. Welcome to the war room. We got death. You. Kill. Jimmy. PJ. B. Austin. I, I am here. Give it to you. How you want to end up one or two hour show and keep the brain running with the premise to talk sports on a national level. Both with the topics. Sort of like some rubbers when it's game time. They like the fat five doing prime time. Sports can glide with the speed. They minds a little bit. For sports medicine and sports veterans and greats. The four for 26. You heard it. You know it. That's what it is. That's what it is. Sports fans, especially basketball fans today, and as usual, ladies who just like to hear our voices, you are once again live in the War Room, brought to you by War Room Sports on that WRS podcast network. I'm Devin McMillan, and I'm here at the round table with one of my partners tonight. I got B. Austin, the hot block commander in the building with me. Uh, we're going to do this Jada and Styles thing for y'all tonight. Uh, we got uh, Jimmy the Blueprint. Shout out to him. Uh, he's out of commission right now. He'll be back with you guys as reserve. soon as he possibly can. So get well soon, brother. All right. So um, it's been a, it's been a sad week in sports, B, man. We lost several icons. Uh, Tark, Dean Smith. Ed Sable, but you know, it's also NBA All-Star Weekend. So we're gonna discuss that and all and, and everything else that happened in the week of sports. So um stay tuned because in the second hour, we're gonna talk to NBA writer Kamal Hilton, who covers the NBA and the Toronto Raptors. You know, he covers the Raptors, but he covers the NBA in general for um for War Room Sports as well as NBA Nation Australia. So we'll have a conversation with Kamal about you know observations from the first half of the season and expectations for the second half of the NBA season. So buckle up, keep it locked right here, and join us right now in the JW Philly Realty chat room, blogtalkradio.com slash the war room, or you could join us on Facebook or Twitter at War Room Sports. You can help us break down the, you know, the all-star game, the all-star weekend, the events. You know, it's not that serious of an event, but uh B. Austin and myself, we're gonna give our predictions on all the winners to all the events. Um, we're not going to break down the fashion show, though. We're not, we're not going to give a winner to the fashion show. That's corny. <laughs> no, because everybody, um, everybody walking in that joint is losing except for the chicks. Yeah, there is no winner to the fashion show. So, um, you know, also when we open up that digital extreme tech hotline, as usual, you guys can call in. That's 323 but before we get this train moved from the station, we got to pay the respects to the family. And when I say family, I mean the other great shows on the War Room Sports Podcast Network. You can listen to the network from our main site. That's warroomsports.com. Or you can get there directly at wrspn.com. You'll find some of the best shows on the Internet, including our show, The War Room. Uh, you'll also find The Broad Street Line with Roy and Chris. After further review, 2.0, a.k.a. the sideline pass with the mayor holding it down straight from NYC, uh, covering everything that's going on uh, this All-Star weekend. Uh, Tissue in the Tape, the hip-hop show with Phil and Savad, the best hip-hop show in, 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 the, in the universe, might I add. And if you don't believe me, just watch. Or should I say, if you don't believe me, just listen. 
Um, and you also find Sports Trap Radio with Brandon and Anthony and a whole lot more. So you can uh, also check out the listings on FatsRadio.com. That's P-H-A-T-Z Radio.com. For airtimes of all your favorite WRSP and sports shows, including our show, The War Room, which airs over there Sundays and Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Yo, B, what's up, man? I mean, we, we know, you know, this Yo. is we, we do sports, but, you know, we, we talk about a little bit of everything, man. I don't know if you watch the Grammys, man, but did you see your man Kanye back at it again? <laughs> Yo, Kanye to the um, I didn't see it. Uh, I'll be honest with you, a lot of the popular culture things that um, so many partake in, I kind of steer away from it, man, because I'd rather just uh, watch social media, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook to see what, you know, what happened and and where the climate is and catch the memes and laugh. So I really didn't see. But I heard because I saw the first time what he did to uh, Taylor Swift, I, I believe it was. And this time he got up and he disrespected Beck. And I think that at this point, man, um, Kanye is funny because I, I, I do feel that he's a very talented artist. I feel that he's somewhat intelligent. Um, and if you listen to some of the things he says, he's actually very insightful. But now that we got the good ish out of the way, my man is arrogant, disrespectful and delusional also to no end. If you get up at any award ceremony when, you know, at some point War Room Sports is getting uh, is getting our SB or whatever uh, sports award that we will be receiving uh, as the great journalist, sports media journalist that we are. If you get up and come on stage in front of us, the it's beat be down that you will receive is only it can only be paralleled by what Wu-Tang would do to you or Suge Knight hey. and his boys or something like that. Like. The There's point no you way. make right now, that's so valuable because look at who he's done it to. Taylor Swift, yeah. Beck. And Beck. He knows who he can do that to and who he can't do yeah, that he to. He knows who he can get away with. Yeah. <laughs> like, like you said, if Wu-Tang was ever, you know, lucky, because they're good enough, but, you know, the Grammys is a whole different thing. If they were ever lucky enough to, to win a Grammy, he not jumping up there talking about Wu Tang. I, I actually should have beat out Wu Tang for the for the award. I actually I actually selected that group specifically because he's on there. He's on there, Woody. He's a Wu Tang sycophant, so he would probably carry water up to them and wash their feet. But yo, Kanye is out of yo. He's out of pocket, man. He's out of pocket. Yo, see, but this time you know with the with the whole Taylor Swift thing a few years ago, you know he actually went up there and basically stepped in front of her on the microphone and said what he had to say this time, you know, he, he went up there and then he turned around everybody laughed like it was maybe a joke, but th th you know, seeing what he said afterwards, he was dead serious. And this dude said that the Grammys need to start respecting artistry. Now that's, that's real. That's, that's, real that's, rap. The, that, that's what I'm saying. That's real rap on a, on a usual basis. But when you're talking about Beck, Winning a, an award yeah. over Beyonce, it's like, come on, dude. Like now you, you're a little oh, yeah. bit out of pocket. Yeah. You might have had that speech canned and 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 you just used it in the wrong context because the dude Beck literally plays like 16 instruments. Yeah. He plays like yeah, 16 instruments. You know, Beyonce can dance and can half sing. Like, come on, it, it, you don't you, you don't become a bigger quote unquote artist than the dude Beck. Like he's a walking That's instrument. A good point. But but what I find interesting because I'm I'm like you I actually didn't see it until the next day when it was all over social media, um because you know I've always felt a certain type of way about the Grammys because I really don't think artistry is rewarded um, mm -hmm. as far as the Grammys mm -hmm. are concerned I'm more of an Oscar dude myself so I actually watched like the first hour of the Grammys but I I checked out when uh, uh the Walking Dead came on. So I didn't actually right. see it live, but, you know, I saw it the next day. My question to you, B, because this is the second time he's done this, and this is the second time he's done it when it's involving Beyonce. So my question yeah. to you is, at what point does Jay-Z start to feel some type of way that this dude Kanye is, is so concerned about his wife's career that, you know, he's willing to do disrespectful things <sighs> in public to show some kind of weird friendship with his wife? Like... At what point is Jay like, all right, bro, you you starting to care a little too much now. Like, calm down. <laughs> Yo, that's a great point. 
I don't know really how to address that either because on one level, um, Kanye is one of the founding fathers of the new ninja movement. And you can substitute <laughs> another word for ninja, but I'm going to be polite on air. Like the new, the new ninja movement, these dudes don't respect the same things that we, you know, came up respecting. They don't have the same concept of dignity. They don't have, like, there was a time, three things in specific, in specificity, that's different. There was a time when, you know, uh, alternative lifestyle was frowned upon uh, and you got ridiculed for it. Not to say that that's correct. Not to say that it's right. It just is what it is. You couldn't bring that around. Uh, feminine clothing was not, you know, that was frowned upon. That's not cool. And, and, and lastly, and most importantly, uh, Richard riding, Richard eating, uh, sycophantry, idolatry, all of that type of stuff that's celebrated now. Like, like it's cool. It's okay to be a Richard rider. And, and that is some of the most Richard riding stuff that you can do because Beyonce is not an artist that isn't recognized for right. her success both right. financially she, she economically and, and, a claim, and a claim like yeah you're not standing up for somebody like a lettuce who who doesn't get what she deserves and actually gets disrespected by beyonce but who that's another topic on another that issue. night yeah exactly yeah <laughs> you don't need to stand up for beyonce so it does bring about a certain measure of question because why are you why are you so focused on being friends with these people? I mean, what from what I've seen, Jay, Jay gives Kanye his respects and props as a part of his camp, but Jay don't really bang with the dude. Like, you're not even Emory, know you're not Tata. To his wife, I don't even know if he speak to Kim Kardashian. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah. like they don't acknowledge her existence because you married a bimbo. Like that time I brought great <laughs> grace by your crib and you and your wife looked at me like, well, never mind. But um. Yo, I, I I don't know I don't know what's up I don't know what's up I think that um I think that 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 Kanye needs to relax um find his his inner peace his inner manhood and just just chill brother just make good music go back to college dropout Kanye well, man relax yeah, yeah, that was, he was, stop he was defending my I, lady I, I dug yo but yeah. last thing because I know people are like yo I thought this was a sports show but we told y'all before we do what we want to do um. We own the company, but um. Anyway, uh, my my last point though, it, it just seems kind of weird to me because I'm you know I'm looking at it like, you know I mean we're all close friends. I don't even know how like you said I don't even know how close Jay Z and Kanye really are outside of the business relationship. But let's you know let's say for for shits and giggles that you know they're close friends. But it's like with me like what would I look like like running down to your wife's gig and like <laughs> get, I mean, well, it's a, it's a bad analogy because you know, your wife is, is a boss as well, but let's say, let's say she worked for, for some people and I went down there and I'm in the, in the boss's office, like defending her, like, you know, why didn't she get that promotion? Like you tripping right now. Yeah. Cause there's nobody here. That's better. Like you find that out. Like you gonna be like, yo, Dev. What's the problem? <laughs> we yeah, got this. Like, so, yeah, it's thanks, just weird. But no thanks. Yeah, it, it's a weird situation. Kanye, man, chill out, man. Stop disrespecting people. But look, let's talk some sports. Because I know that's what the people came here to hear. So uh, let me let y'all know what happened this week. Besides Kanye, while y'all were on the ground. And while you're on the ground, it's brought to you as usual by Direct TV. If you'd like a better TV experience than cable has to offer, including that NFL Sunday ticket that you probably won't need for another, you know, five, six months or so. Um, go to our website, warroomsports.com. Click on the Direct TV logo and order yourself a better TV experience at a discounted War Room Sports sign up rate. If you call yourself a sports fan, you got to have Direct TV. All right, B, Greg Hardy, you know, he was one of the names that was. Uh, shining in a negative light throughout the NFL season. Uh, he had the domestic violence charge, but his charges have basically been dismissed. And um, his his appeal, because remember, he was actually convicted, but this was an appeal of a, of the 2014 conviction that was scheduled to go on Monday um, at the courthouse down in North Carolina. But his ex-girlfriend, Nicole Holder, didn't show up for the hearing. Um they said prosecutors have been unable to locate her um, t 
to, you know, to even issue a subpoena. So uh, a lot of people are speculating that Hardy might have made, you know, like a little side deal with her, paid her off or anything like that. So what do you think? I mean, because the question everybody's asking is, okay, the team sign him now, but like, is he vindicated because she didn't show up? Like, is there any inkling out here that he didn't do this? Like, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Chick might be dead. Um, I actually, you know, I'm. It, that was funny, but it's not funny because that's that's the first thing that I thought when you started going into the detail of her being um, out of out of it's contact, or you know, yeah. people like, is she is she still with us? Um, I think that in the case of Greg Hardy, you have to look at. Um, you have to look at his past. You have to look at his reputation. And let's, you know, let's be frank here and, and honest. The NFL is not about great character. It's about how well you can produce on the field and how you can bring value to a brand and how many tickets you can sell. Um, so they don't really care whether there are nice men playing this game of foosball. Um, but is he... I don't know, man. I don't know, what man. What they care I, about I, is when it, when it seeps into to their business. But other than that, yeah. Right, when it seeps, and when 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 their female when their female fans take offense to a woman beater being on a roster, that's when the NFL acts because it's a response rather than a proactive, um, a proactive uh, metering out of justice or punishment based on you know some standard of of, of justice or 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 morals it's not about that it's really about affecting their bottom line um right. it, specifically to, to hardy i don't know man i don't i don't think he's vindicated i think if you study the case uh enough i think it really is a, a matter of the charges have have to be dropped because the victim isn't willing to cooperate any longer so does that mean he didn't do it no that does not mean he didn't do it um, does that mean he's well, remember? No, it does remember, not. I don't, I don't remember this is an appeal. He was already found right. guilty. This is an appeal, so. right? So there was enough evidence to convict right. him, and now it's a technicality that's getting him off. Right. Do I sign him if I'm an NFL club? Hell yeah, I sign Greg Hart. <laughs> no question. Um, as yeah. a man, do I respect him or his actions? No, hell no, I don't. It's two separate things. It's two separate right. things, and, I, and it all depends on how the, the ownership I, works. I used the word speculation earlier when I was talking mm -hmm. about the possible deal between uh, Hardy and uh, the woman. But um, I'm reading here that that there's a quote unquote there's reliable information that Holder and Hardy have reached a civil settlement, and that she has intentionally made herself unavailable to, to the state. I mean. Going back to her and her whereabouts, you know, I hope that's true for her sake. I hope it's not, you know, the other thing that we personally speculated on a few minutes ago. But, yeah, it, it's the it's a situation like you're saying. If, if we're part of the NFL and the dude is, is free and clear, he's that talented of a dude that you have to sign him unless there is a club out there that's willing to place integrity, you know, before wins and losses. And I've yet to see that. You know that particular franchise, mm -hmm. so I, we'll stick. We'll stick around, see how this plays out. Um, but I at least hope that somebody hears from the girl soon. You know, just so we know that that right. part of it is straight. Um, right. In other news, though, uh, Jamal Lewis, uh, his Super Bowl ring was recently sold in an auction, but it wasn't the Super Bowl ring that he actually won with the Ravens in 2012 when mm -hmm. they won, even though he had already retired. Um, the Ravens owner gave Jamal Lewis a ring because he basically said Jamal is one of the all-time uh, Raven greats. So he just wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do him and a few other cats a salad for helping to build this, you know, franchise and this culture um, of winning that they do now have in Baltimore. Um, <laughs> but the ring sold in an auction on Sunday morning for like $50,820. And, um, Biscotti, Steve Biscotti was asked about it. And he basically said, well, Jamal Lewis informed us that he was forced to sell the, the, the ring due to financial difficulties. And, you know, we remember hearing Jamal Lewis's name 
um, associated with financial troubles for the past few years. Uh, it's crazy because, you know, when he was in the league, he was one of the guys that was in the league trying to get his grind on. And I, I, I guess he was so far into that, he wasn't really, you know, doing anything else to make his money last after his playing days. But how sad is it be that, you know, this dude is selling Super Bowl rings, even though it's not his, but I'm assuming his is probably gone as well. Assumption. Well, whenever you bring up, whenever you bring up Jamal Lewis, you got to. Yo, yo. I go by the name, by the name I'm of Pharrell from the Neptunes. Neptunes. And I just want to let y'all know I'm your, I'm your pusher. <laughs> yo, um, if, if some of y'all don't recall, he was caught with um a, a very what i would consider is a very large amount of narcotics and cash uh he was able to invest in great legal counsel which was able to point to uh places where reasonable doubt could be found and he only ended which up is probably like why he's broke here yeah he, he broke. probably cost him about three million to get this system off him um and so he was in that situation um, all-time great Raven. I'm not really offended by this story because it kind of feels to me like, okay, he won a Super Bowl ring that he sweat, he blood, sweat, and tears were, were, were exchanged for that ring. Cool. He's not selling that. He's not auctioning that. A ring that someone gave him that he didn't get in the trenches for, is it a little Bush League? Yeah. Is it a little corny? If I was the owner, I would feel some type of way about it. I do think it's tacky for him to do it, but it's not it's not offensive. I mean, if he's really facing financial troubles, you got to do what you got to do to take care of your family and take care of yourself. So it kind of is what it is. There's no real value to him, sentimental value. Him. Hey, so, I guess Jamal's like, look, man, uh, Steve, <laughs> if, if, if you care about me like this and, you know, I'm an all time raving great, then you know, a couple of dollars. Couple dollars. I don't need a ring. I don't need no jewelry. Give me a couple of dollars. Give me a job. Make, make me a consultant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give, me, give me, me a job. Give me give something. Me, make me the running backs right. consultant. Yeah, yeah. What's Deuce wrong? in the league, coaching. So, what's up with your mom? With tattoos on his neck. <laughs> all right so so keeping it in the nfl man one of our favorite players of all time personally i i think you know bar barring position he might be the greatest football player of all time um jerry rice has quickly become a target of patriots fans and not only patriots fans just anybody else who just doesn't deal with uh, uh with hypocrites um jerry rice admitted in a video done i believe by it was an espn feature on the gloves worn by uh pass catchers today and he was telling a story and he said quote i know this might be a little illegal guys but just but but just put a little spray a little stick them on them to make sure that the texture is a little sticky so he's saying you know he did this before he used to do this um you know Gr jerry rice widely known and recognized i don't know if there's anybody who argues that he's the greatest receiver you know, in the history of the NFL, he admits this. And it's not just that he admitted that because everybody knows that, you know, everybody do a little cheating here and there from time to time. But just a few days later, he got on TV and ripped the Patriots a new one for deflating footballs. So it's like, if I don't know what he thought. I mean, if you're doing a piece for ESPN, you know that the video is going to come out at some point. It's ESPN. They don't just you know, record things for nothing. They don't just waste uh, tape space like that. But um, what are your thoughts on this? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, I don't want to say, you know, everybody did it, so it's cool. I don't want to give him a pass because he's Jerry Rice, but I think my bigger issue is the fact that he was on his holier-than-thou joint about the Patriots and just went hard at them just days after you just admitted that you cheated yourself. So what's your thoughts about your man, Jerry Rice? Uh, Jerry, you put your foot in your mouth. Um, you know, if, if I were of a sycophantic nature, I would go in the, in the super defense of the dude. But, I mean, who he is speaks for itself. The reality is, dude, you, you might have you might have should have kept your mouth shut on one or the other. You could have brought one up or you could have brought the other up. 
and left it alone. But you can't tell people that you, you know, you cheated a little bit and then go and criticize somebody else for cheating probably a lot. Um, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Um, but you know, that being said, um, you know, 860, uh, targets, 1549 receptions, 22,895 yards and 197 touchdowns. I mean, it doesn't I mean, matter what stick him was on it, there. It, yeah, he is who he is regardless. Yeah. But you know, to go, on radio and on TV, and I'm, I'm not saying imply that the Patriots were cheaters. I'm saying call them out to be call cheaters blatantly yeah. and said that if they win the Super Bowl, it should have an asterisk by it because of the flated balls. So, you know, that's when I start asking people, well, if that's the case, then should, you know, the, the 49ers have uh, asterisk by their Super Bowl wins because they had the greatest player in the league, maybe the greatest player in league history, who, you know, admitted to doing something that was against the rules. Um, so, you know, it, it's just one of those things, man. Jerry, like you said, he put his foot in his mouth a little bit, but yeah. don't be a hypocrite. If you're cool with cheating, you know, if, if they ask you, you be go cool on TV. Even, yeah, yeah, even if you don't want to just straight up say that you're if cool you with cheating, don't if you condemn cheating, you trying. like you did anything wrong. You know what I'm saying? But if you're not cool with cheating, even though you did a little bit of cheating yourself, I, you just got to go easier on the Patriots, dude. You, it's just, especially, yeah, I mean, you're in the same sport. It. Hey, he, he, and that's what right. he did. He let those dudes have it. Like they should have asterisks by their Super Bowl win. Well, and and, I, and it, I understand, I, I understand what, what he was, what he was saying and why he made the, the difference being you have an organization cheating which touches every single player and member versus one single player's personal decision to put a little sticky on their gloves it's a different it's different it is different but it's still it's still cheating so now you look bad because you condone you're 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 condoning it by your actions so you can't be yeah you can't be a hypocrite all right well um your man lebron james is trying his his hand at acting, you know, on the big screen. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I posted. Uh, I sent you guys the uh, the trailer of the movie that he's going to be in. Um, it's called Trainwreck. It's a Judd Apatow film, um, and LeBron's featured in it. I mean, you know, he's not a big part in it, but he has a couple of uh, cameos in the movie. Um, I don't know if you watched the trailer, but one thing that came up, you know, when I posted that on our Facebook page, a few fans were like. You know, LeBron needs to focus on basketball. Now, do you have a problem with LeBron getting his twism on in the middle of the season? I mean, I'm sure he didn't shoot it um, in the middle of the season, but you know how it's going to look to fans. The movie's going to come out right. dead smack in the middle of basketball season, so people think that LeBron's doing something that he shouldn't be doing. You got a problem with him getting his twism on? His Shazam? Not in, a, <laughs> not, not in a vacuum, not in and of itself. Uh, singularly, my problem is this is one step in a chain of many. This is a pattern, uh, and, and not just not specifically the acting thing, but overall, this is a gentleman that is concerned with business, his brand, being famous, generating money, and being you know a a, a staple in society as a as a beacon of culture i don't know i mean my issue with that is he does not seem consumed with being great on the basketball court i think he, he may take that for granted and believe hey listen i can do other things outside of ball that i'm not condemning it i'm not condemning it because you know you do have other greats that were able to do similar things like your man twism i mean neon bordeaux was able to do a lot of things throughout his 20, almost 20 year career in the NBA, but he's another guy as great as Neon Zedo was. He's a bit of an underachiever, right? He's an underachiever. People don't realize that dude is an underachiever because he was so great, but he could have challenged the Kareem's, the Wilts of, of the world for that supremacy at the center position 
as opposed to just being satisfied with 24 and, and, and 10, you know, and saying, look, it's 24 and 10. It's, you're never going to keep me out of the hall of fame with numbers like that, you know, but he could have been better. So I, I look at, I look at LeBron in the same light. I mean, he's the best player in the league right now by far, but he actually still could be better if he was consumed with being better, with being great. I think right now yeah. at a certain level, it's kind of on cruise control for him. Yeah, I think he's I think good. the league as it's currently constitute, constituted might just be – it just might be too easy for LeBron. So it's like – he can he can live out his Michael Jordan. I want to be a billionaire fantasies while he's playing a little, even a little more than Mike did. You know, Mike did commercials and this and that, and and Nike basically took care of his future riches and made his deals and stuff like that. But LeBron is and his crew, you know, they're hands on whether the season's going on or not. And, and and I commend them. I commend them for it. At the same time, I am starting to see some things in LeBron that I've never seen before. You know, like him. I mean, I know he's getting older, but you're just not used to seeing LeBron just missing games here and there for little nicks and scrapes and stuff like that. He always seemed kind of indestructible as far as that's concerned. And even now, I don't think he's missed a game this season. This is my point. I don't think he's missed a game where he actually had to miss a game. Like, I can't go to take a midseason vacation. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just think I think that's the culture of the league now, and with uh, a successful coach like Greg Popovich doing it and kind of setting the precedence, I, I just think that you know it's it's ingrained deeply into the culture of the NBA now. He has a, a method to his madness because his players are a little bit older, um, but he also mm -hmm. he's starting to rest some of his younger guys as well from time to time um, to keep them fresh for that for that playoff push. Um, good for the team because you know they last year they won another title doing that. Bad for the fans who pay to see these guys every night. So it's like you you go to a mm -hmm. game, you don't want to see LeBron sitting out for an injury where he could go just because you know, okay, this might be a little stretch where we're gonna get some wins regardless of from here or not. So let me rest. Like we're just not used to seeing that, like people from our generation. Yeah. So you know, You're right. I, I it is funny because when no. I go to a Cavs game, I'm really only going to see J.R. Smith and Kyrie Irving. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're good with it. But um Yeah, I'm good. Right, so that's more shots for my man. Yeah, I know. I, but um this is what happened this week, everybody. Why y'all were on the grind. And uh before we get into some hot topics, I'm gonna just give a few birthday shout outs because that's what we do around this time. And uh your birthdays, of course, are brought to you by Digital Extreme Technologies. Does your business, do you or your business need a custom website? Well, for dynamic, professional, and most of all, affordable custom website solutions, you need Digital Extreme Technologies. No need to break the bank for an effective online presence, top quality, results-driven websites at incredibly affordable prices. Financing options are also available, so visit digitalextremetech.com or call 267-205-4203. And for discounted rates, be sure to tell them War Room Sports sent you. My birthday! Yay! All right, we want to give a birthday shout out to Scott Pollard. Scott Pollard turns forty. Uh, Phillies. He's forty. <laughs> I know Scott Pollard is forty. Man, it's it's like life is going too fast. Um, it's, getting, it's getting near the end. <laughs> too too close. Uh, our, our hometown Philadelphia Phillies uh, executive, Ruben Amaro, and former MLB player, he turns 50. Brent Jones, uh, former San Francisco 49er tight end and the recipient of what is known as the catch. For me, okay. one of those moments in sports where I think is grossly overrated. Um, <laughs> he turns 52 today. You know, another one of those moments, man. And it, it might have come up cool. later when we talk a little bit about Dean Smith. But to me, that Michael Jordan shot against Georgetown is one of the most overrated yeah. things in sports history. Yeah. Man. Because he made what that you're saying, like what you're 17 saying is seconds left in the game. Georgetown came down, turned the ball over. You know, like North Carolina still had to play defense. And Georgetown came down and made a boneheaded play to for the, for the turnover, right. which really won the game. 
So, I, you know, they just need it. You, so, you need a so, start. You need a you need a starting period for maybe the greatest basketball story of all time. He he's the he's so what you're saying, arguably the greatest player saying? of all time. You need something to 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 start that story on, and I think they've overblown that 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 scenario just so they can have that starting point. What you're saying with Brent Jones is that NFL uh, professional tight ends who practice catching a football should do just that, catch a football. Okay. Yo, he just stretched, his, he stretched his arms up. and I mean, it was an important moment. Um, yeah. I Maybe I think it should probably be dubbed something different because they call it the catch as if he made some Odell Beckham type <laughs> crazy catch to <laughs> – to get that, that score, that right. one could be called the routine catch. Yo, it could just be the routine the touchdown or something like. But the <laughs> catch, like, yo, he just put his arms up in there and caught the ball. He was damn near wide open. So I, I, I maybe I just don't understand why they call it what they call it. But shout out to Brent Jones on his fifty second birthday. Anyway, I don't mean to diminish your <laughs> your greatest achievement on your birthday. And then special well, shout. I'm sure out. you had some better catches. I know. <laughs> Special shout out to a pioneer in, in in not just basketball, but a pioneer in sports. Um, a pioneer Under for it. what a lot of these black athletes can do right now. And that's Bill Russell. Happy birthday. Shout out to him. He turns 81 oh, years man. old today. And probably Happy like they did the, the other year in the uh, All-Star. Remember they serenaded him like the players and the whole crowd. Yeah. Yeah. serenaded him yeah. at the all-star game on his I thought that was so, pretty special man yeah a lot of corny hot. stuff goes on at the all-star game but that was not corny <laughs> that was that was hot all right that well shout out to, to to all of these gentlemen on their uh birthdays nice big war room salute it's my birthday yay all right and before we get into these hot topics you guys have to remember and if you don't remember just write this down because i'm about to dictate to you check out our website warroomsports.com while you're there be sure to sign up for the war report that's our newsletter click on the contact us tab on the website so you can send us a message about our company our show or to inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities yes we do offer them so if you run a small business we can help you get your business to where it needs to be call us email us whatever if you want to email us about that just hit us at info at warroomsports.com while you're browsing the site, take your time, click on the memorabilia tab, support us, buy some War Room Sports merchandise, click the blog tab, make sure you read our latest sports articles in the All's Fair and Sports and War blog. We got some great writers on that blog, so just, you know, and it's growing, so check it out. Then you can click the respective icons and tabs to like our Facebook page, to follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our iTunes podcast, watch our webcast at warroomsportstv.com. We have about eight shows on that. Uh, you can listen to our radio network at WRSPN.com. We got 10 shows on that, and we might be adding an 11th show uh, sometime early next week. Um, and you can download our free War Room Sports mobile app on Android or iOS, so you can get everything I just mentioned on the go. Join the JW Philly Realty chat room right now during the show. You can get there by going to blogtalkradio.com slash the war room to enter the chat room. Just sign up for a free profile on Blog Talk Radio. If you don't want to do that, or if you don't already have one, you can also sign into your Facebook and Twitter accounts. We know you have those. So while you're at it, make sure you click follow so you can get updates and reminders about anything happening with the show. We'll be taking questions and reading posts from Facebook, Twitter, and the chat room during the show. But if you want to call in and speak with us, the Digital Extreme Technologies hotline is now open. That number is 323-410-0012. Press 1 when prompted. If you already listen from your phone, just press one if you want to talk. All right, let's get into some of these hot topics, man. Hey, hey B, you, you want to let everybody know who hot topics are brought to them by? Hot topics is brought to you by audio. Schedule too hectic to read as much as you like. Well, try audiobooks and kick back and let someone else do the reading for you. All you have to do is visit Audible and sign up for your free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com forward slash warroom sports. In no time, you can be listening to the latest bestsellers, hands free, stress free, while getting other things done at the same damn time. You can be in the whip, read. You can be on a flight, reading. You could be on a treadmill, reading. No excuses. 
<laughs> you could be getting a Chewbacca. Oh. Reading. Um, Reading. <laughs> all right, man. We <laughs> we mentioned it in our intro, man. It was some uh some some deaths in sports. So, you know, we're gonna take a couple of minutes to talk about it because yo, I, I in my opinion, I think three sports icons, not just sports yes. figures, yes. not just sports coaches. Yes. You know, not just people who film sports games. I think three icons died this week. Um, one being Dean yes. Smith, University of North Carolina. Uh, one being Jerry Tarkanian, Tark the Shark, and Tark then Ed the Shark. Sable. We already had this situation with with Steve Sable. Now his father, who outlived him by a few years, um, passed away at ninety eight. But let's talk a little bit first about Dean Smith, he, who who died at the age of eighty three. Man. Talking about uh, Dean Smith and listening to all of his players and, and and everybody who who weighed in on his passing this week, you know, it seems like mm-hmm. more than just a basketball coach. It seems like Dean Smith, you you know, kind of be like when we talk to people, we pop. talk to old heads who played for 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 Lombardi, and they all seem like mm-hmm. Lombardi wasn't just their coach. No, he was like a figure. Dean Smith, that same type of respect from his players which you would expect more because they are you know college age students it's got you know the lombardi thing was amazing to me because he's like grown men who like (laughs) who need daddies but um yo what what are your thoughts on dean smith the coach the man like everything as a coach coach, you you know as well you know how we have top five dead or alive um I would say top 10 doesn't matter when. Um, he's <laughs> not know. top five, but he's, he's, he's top 10 no matter when you start counting from for, for me. Um, and this is, I'm speaking objectively because there are two college t- collegiate teams that I hate um, Duke and North Carolina. I, I feel as though if they fall off the face of the earth, you will, you, there will be no tears for me. But a part of what makes you hate programs or organizations or even players is a same, is a is a is also a motivation for respect. And Dean Smith deserves, demands, and commands respect as a coach and as a leader uh, of that North Carolina program. I mean, the athletes that he turned out, the impact that he's had on those athletes and the game. Um, he deserves nothing but the highest of admiration and respect. You know, that's that's my take on Dean Smith. Yeah, no doubt. What like I, said, I learned a lot. Learned, yeah, what are Man, some of the things you learned about him this week? Um, first of all, I learned this week that you know he he basically integrated the ACC. He was the first coach in the ACC to sign a black player. Um, I believe that I player might have been a, a, a. I think it was Charlie Scott, and. You know, I, I actually heard him speak this week and he was, you know, they were asking him if he and Dean Smith talked about that stuff, you know, while he was on the team, because he was the only black guy basically on, on the team, basically in the whole conference. So you can imagine that traveling around the ACC wasn't that pleasant of an experience for him. But he was like, you know, Dean really never talked to him about that because I think his philosophy was to treat everybody on the team the same way. So if he was to bring up, you know, why this guy was different and, you know, why he might be being treated yep. different, he would think Not, that yeah. he, he's treating him differently than than he's treating everybody else. Um, so, you know, that, that's one of the more important things that I learned. And, you know, we always hear Michael Jordan and, and James Worthy and those guys speak very highly of him. And Michael Jordan always used the word father figure. You know, when he was in school, that was mm-hmm. his coach. That was his mentor. That was his father figure. Um, as you mentioned earlier, come on, look how many NBA players this dude has turned out. And I'm not talking about just players, like NBA greats. So, I mean, um, right. I think we actually have a, a UNC fan on the line. Um, I think we got Rob from Cali on the line. And we'll get to him in a minute. I just want to. Uh, give out some coaching facts from Dean Smith. Uh, he had 30, 36 seasons as, as the coach in North Carolina. That was from like uh, 61 to 1997. His, uh, he was 879 
in, in 254. That was his record. So he had a 77, almost 78 percent win percentage. Uh, he retired with more wins than any coach in men's division one history. So that's where that whole top five thing comes be when you when you were talking about that earlier, like people will look at the records because there's coaches that that have more wins now. But, you know, when he hung them up, he was that dude when he hung them up. Yeah, you know, he was. Some people stay he, around he a little was. longer. Um, he had 11 Final Four appearances, two national championships, 1982 um, with the Jordan shot and 1993, um, 17 ACC regular season titles and 13 ACC tournament titles. Uh, he was 364 and 136 all time in ACC regular season play. That's a 73% uh, win percentage. He was eight time ACC coach of the year 67, 68, 71, 76, 77, 79, 88, 93. Um, they, UNC finished in the top three in the ACC regular season standings in each of his 33 seasons as a head coach. Um, he had one losing season in 36 years. Um, which was eight and nine, and that was back in 1961. You know, he had one losing season, and it was his very first season. Um, and he was also the head coach of the gold medal winning USA men's Olympic team back in uh, Montreal in 1976. So he has a laundry list of accomplishments. You know, I'm going to cut the list a little short because I don't want to sit here all day and, and be on my Dean Smith, Richard Ridery when we got a lot of other things to talk about. But I mean, he was an all-time great. So let, let, let's get Rob from out in Cali on the line because I'm sure you want to say something about the coach of of his favorite uh, basketball program. Rob, what's going on? Dean Smith. Oh, what's up, man? What's up, man? What up? What up? Uh, you have some thoughts uh, about and, the and great Austin, Dean Smith? And the Austin, it's, they are, he's the top five. I wouldn't say top five. He's number one. You know, <laughs> okay, okay, let's just get that. There's somebody, right, wait, there's somebody wait, else in North I, I, Carolina. Wait, wait. I know, I know, I know that you're a North Carolina fan, so I know you got a little bias, but you're also a West Coaster. So you're telling me you're going to put Dean Smith over, over John Wooden? Yeah, I mean, before people don't know, it's because before I even knew, before I even knew any concept of sports, man, I was powdered and. The baby blue diapers, man. I mean, come on, man. I mean, I was born in North Carolina. I never lived there. John I was Wooden born there. Was John, so, yeah, what that I got put, to do with Dean? <laughs> Dean? Dean, I mean, not only he integrated the league, but he was there in the Topeka in the, in the whole, uh, when it came to integrating schools, he was right there. And he integrated, I think, the first high school college basketball team. People forget about that. I mean, Kobe said he was about he would he was about to or he would have went to UNC over any other school, you know. With Kobe Dean said Smith, he would have went to uh, be trying to make all the fan oh, bases feel cool. No, 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 no. Kobe no, said he no. would have gone to Duke. Kobe too dark to go to Duke. Kobe too dark to go to Duke. I've heard yo. Kobe say no, no, because Kobe Kobe grew up the right way to go to Duke. Uh, you know played his high school basketball in the suburbs of Philadelphia, not in the inner city. Um, so I, I, I think he was Duke material. And every time he plays for Coach K on the U.S. Olympic team and they they interview him, he always talks about, well, you know, this is my chance to play with Coach K because I would have played with him had I gone to college. So I'm pretty sure both of them were in his final four of schools that he was looking at. I, I think he would now, ended Kobe up at your, at your, at your limits. Kobe also <laughs> said he was going to play with his father, Mike Jordan, in uh, D.C. I mean, if you believe Kobe. Yeah, Kobe was never going yeah. any of these places, so it's it's easy for him to say this after the fact. <laughs> Kobe just be rapping. You know, you, you know, I do. I will agree that Coach K is a good coach. Is a good coach. He does work well with less talent. You know, but he, it doesn't help you develop in the, to the NBA, you know, as we saw Christian Leitner. But, um, uh, yeah, man. Oh, by the way, all our P.O.C. Muslim students. I, I, man, I think you I think you use another bad example, man. Christian Leitner, okay, to be considered maybe, maybe, one of, you know, I'll say one of, but some people think he could have been, like, the greatest college, at least the greatest modern-day college player. I, Chris, 
Christian Leitner didn't have a bad NBA career. I think, you know, certain people just expected him to be a straight up superstar. But Christian Leitner, like in his first year, averaged 18 a game and 17 a game, 16, 16, 18. Like Christian Leitner wasn't a bad NBA player. So I, I definitely think that's, that's a bad. Yeah. Like he wasn't just like somebody that, that opposing teams feared, but. You know, the dude average like eight. Man, eight. listen. Shout out to Dean Smith. Rest in power. A great contributor to uh to the modern game of basketball uh on the NCAA front, man. Shout shout out to Dean, man. No doubt. But what 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 else what's on your mind, uh Rob? Right? Oh, what's on my mind? Uh, two things. I, and I'm just going to bring it up real fast. I know you all everybody else. I'm on public transportation. Um, <laughs> Shout with, out uh, to Rob. Uh, right. You support from Rob, anywhere. The, the, the whole, the whole um, thing with the, with the Chicago students, the whole different area. Oh, yeah. The Jackie, Man, Jackie we, Robinson we, we, West. We, we 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 all been doing. I mean, what I know is uh, the geographic. The geographic. People been doing that for years. I remember my pops used to tell me uh, the only reason why he went to um and when he lived in, he, you know, he's from Brooklyn. He went to the whole the whole um basically the other side of the city to go to school, and they gave him fake addresses and names just to play football. You know. Well, you dry snitching. The, you dry, You snitching. You snitching. Hey, that's what I'm saying. No, it, it's, it's no doubt that people been doing it. You, you just can't get caught. <laughs> you, can't get caught. you know, and and you know, it's it's bad enough. It's very sad. They shouldn't take. I hope. I hope some kids go up to you know to do to do whatever because it's, it's very unfortunate. But we'll see mm-hmm. how it plays out. It's all to me. It's all politics. It's all urban politics. And Chicago, they have a bad inner city. You have to look at their politics. Um, also, yeah. that also, I know this. I know um, the NBA All Star Game is coming up. I want to get. I want to know what what y'all thoughts on that because I I'm gonna watch it. I'm not gonna watch the celebrity game. Cause it's always trash. So you know. <laughs> well, I actually watched the celebrity game just for laughs because you know I. I'm, yeah. I'm as goofy as they come, so I like to see dudes think they can play that can't really play. Um, no, but we, we're going to talk about uh, the, the All-Star game. Matter of fact, like the whole second half of the show is going to be about that. We're, we're going to have Kamal Hilton on as well. He covers the Raptors um, up in Toronto, um, and he also writes a column for us weekly. So so just keep it locked in, and, and you'll get our – you know, you'll hear what we got to say about Jackie Robinson West, about the All-Star game and all that stuff. Rob, as usual, man, thanks for your call. Like I said, make sure you keep it locked so you can hear what we got to say about everything you asked about. Yo, man, Rob. Be, be safe oh, out there, bro. right. good, brother. Duke, right. Duke is support. going down next week. Duke, we got <laughs> right. you. We want you coming in. We're coming for that. All right. Peace out. <laughs> Yo, Rob going to get his – uh. He's going to get his dad's football team, his high school football team, wins yeah. uh, taken yeah, away. He's going to get the championship taken. 40, 40 years yeah. later. <laughs> out there snitching. Um, all right, so, yeah, uh, shout out to, to to Dean Smith, man, and everything that he stood for. Um, Ed Sable also passed away this week at the age of 98. Now, you know, we know Ed Sable's the founder of NFL Films, and when Steve Sable passed away, uh we talked about how much um, they changed the way that we that we watch the game of football. And Steve Sable, you know, being the son and, and closer to our generation, he was probably the the voice and the the face that we saw most often and probably associated more with the actual company. But Ed Sable, as we talked about when he went into the Hall of Fame, like he was the dude with the vision. He's the dude who started it all. And mm-hmm. I basically just thank them because there were, there were times in my life where, you know, it's nothing much happening on a weekend. I could just sit down on a whole Saturday and just watch NFL films presents, uh, whatever it is, and just, just chill and and have a great day doing it. So, you know, they're they're, they're the reasons that we're inside the game, like, like fans are these days. So man, 
Rest in peace to Ed. Saban. I would say, I would say that Ed Saban, the NFL owes its present form and success to Ed Sable because if you look at what everything is now today, it's a everybody is a content creator, and Ed and, and his son were some of the pioneers in recognizing that the NFL, the league, and the brand was a content creation platform. They owe, you know, the Sable family brought billions of dollars in revenue and value to the NFL. That's, that's, that's just the bottom line. That's what it is. The NFL today wouldn't be what it is without Ed Sable. War Room Sports wouldn't be War Room Sports indirectly without Ed Sable's contribution to NFL football. Word. Yo, this is so this is some of the stuff power. that that he introduced to sports fans and, and, and the game of football. Um, remember, they they started the super slow motion replays. They had the whole series of blooper reels. Um, they had the whole series of uh, videos about big hits, which they really can't do anymore now because they're uh, predicating everything on safety. Um, the reverse angle shots. Uh, they were the first people mm-hmm. to actually put to mic up coaches and players and and, and uh, do highlights to music. And they recorded stuff that was happening in the locker room, like pregame speeches and stuff like that. So um, this is a lot of stuff that we take for granted because we're used to it being that way now. There's a lot of people, including us, like we were born into this kind of stuff. So we think that's just the way it is. But th- there were a lot of people who came before us who watched football before you know, before we did and, and the game was nowhere near as exciting. Um, I mean, the game was exciting in, in, in of itself, but I'm talking about the art, you know, the artificial excitement, you know, what you did to the broadcast or what you did to, to, to highlight videos and things like that. So yeah, as fans, we definitely owe the Sable family a lot. And, and Ed Sable was the patriarch of that family and, and the, the, the man with the idea. So no shout out doubt. to him. Got NFL films, yeah. got NFL network now. Uh, Tark the shark. <laughs> Tark the shark. Man, Jerry Tark- Tarkanian died. They say these things happen in threes. And I guess in the sports world this week, uh, it, it was no different. Uh, UNLV, former UNLV coach with the running Rebs, Jerry Tark, he died at 84. Um, Tarkanian, I don't hear his name mentioned too much mm-hmm. when you talk about greats um because you know and we you know why the, the, yeah there, there, there's reasons behind that but when you look at tart i mean he had a record of 729 wins versus 201 losses he was top one two three four five six seven all time as far as win percentage goes with a 78.4 win percentage um, we remember those those running rebel teams back when we were young. Uh, Larry Johnson and and Greg Anthony, who Greg Anthony by the way, who's getting who's getting that uh that charge drop for thirty two hours of community service. Money go a long way. Um, you know Anderson Hunt, uh, Stacy Augman, yo the running Rebs, who everybody thought threw that game to Duke the the second year round. But um, that's one of the greatest college teams that we've ever seen. And, yo, <laughs> you remember Tark on the sideline with the with the towel in his mouth, man? What are some of – what are your thoughts on, on him and some of your memories of Tark the Shark? Um, first of all, I think Tark the Shark is top ten now or then. Um, not top five, but definitely top ten. I think that – I have a weird perception of Tark. Um, that that really is 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 positive light. I know that Jerry Tarkanian gave young men from the inner city an opportunity to showcase their talent. Um, despite NCAA rules, uh, he definitely didn't respect those rules or he bent them uh, to the to the fullest. But in that regard, I kind of look at it as you can't hate the player, hate the game. Like Tark just was able, he was able to recruit like crazy. I, I, next to to Calipari and Patino, Tark's gotta be 
the third guy you think of when we talk about recruiting and recruiting talent. You know, um, an amazing talent recruiter, man, an amazing talent recruiter. And I think that, you know, you have certain coaches that have the 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 angelic image, you know, Mike Krzyzewski, Dean Smith, you know, guys like that, Roy Williams. Then you got Tark. But Tark is 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 on a level. He kind of reminds me of like a John Lucas, man. He's of the people. In a lot of ways, or, that's my perception. Or, or, or Kyle Perry, where his reputation yeah, yeah. is not that great, but his talent, recruitment, and and coaching skills speak for himself. Oh, it's out of out of this, yeah, it's out of this world. Um, I actually remember talk from the uh, Fresno days with uh, the uh, the drug addict Chris Heron, uh, <laughs> and you know the playground legend Skip to my Lou, uh, right. giving him a chance to really you know ply his trade. And, and showcase it and get it to the next level. So, you know, he's brought a lot of positive basketball. Yeah, oh, I think that's an overachieved. They Chris Heron, good. you know, he came, they, they thought Chris Heron was going to be, you know, tough in the NBA. I mean, he had some problems he, he couldn't get over. My man, um, yo, my man was all about the Heron. Chris Heron. Yeah, but Chris Heron. <laughs> but he, um, yeah, like I said, he amassed that 729 wins. Uh, over a span of 31 years with three Division One schools. He started at Long Beach State, uh, was at UNLV, and like you said, he had those days uh, at Fresno. So he kept it out on the West Coast, West Coast guy. But, um, man, rest in peace to Jerry Tarkanian, man. Like I said, I, I always remember yeah. as, a, as a youngster thinking it was weird, like, yo, why does this dude always had a towel in his mouth? I actually heard a story <laughs> about that this week that I – hadn't heard i might have heard it i just may have forgotten it but um i was listening to gary williams the former coach of maryland um and he was talking saying that tart did that because he didn't want to run back and forth to the scores table you know he didn't want to run back and forth all game getting water so what he would do is wet the towel fold it up and he would suck water from the towel all day you know all game that's I'm like oh. that's nasty yeah, hey, that's, that's nasty. That's and I hope like, nasty. you know, it wasn't a situation where somebody came by, you know, wiped something, wiped themselves off on his towel by mistake, <laughs> and then Tark put it back in his mouth. That's nasty. Pete on that jump. Yeah. But <laughs> so uh yo, rest in peace. Shout out to Dean Smith, Ed Sable, and Jerry Tarkanian, because we definitely lost three Titans Word. in the world of sports this week. Um, big story that we gotta take. A few minutes to talk about um, the caller. Rob oh, just boy. called in and, and mentioned it. And it's the whole business about uh, Jackie Robinson West, the Chicago Little League team that won the U.S. championship of the Little League World Series. Now, their their U.S. title has been stripped. And it's basically because uh, there was there was basically districting problems and, and penalties I'm not, I'm not going to say penalties. I'm going to say <laughs> violations. Um, the story basically goes that they were basically forging addresses for players who really didn't live in the correct district to play for this particular team. So the other teams in Chicago were basically accusing them of poaching players from other people's districts illegally to make their super team, which ended up going on and winning the little league world series. Um, a lot of people dismissed this thinking, well, man, this is little league sports. Why is it that serious? But I, little league sports, especially when you're to the, to the level where you're dealing with the actual uh, little league international, it, it gets serious like this. So what are your thoughts on, on this whole thing? Um, because talking all week, us being, you know, people of African American heritage, you know, the first thing I heard a lot of people doing was was playing the race card. Um, do you think mm -hmm. that's that's a valid card to play in this situation? Do you mm -hmm. think the fact that yeah, the team was, is all had anything to do with them being stripped? Of course, I I was one of the people that played that card. Um, I've had a number of discussions on social media 
Um, I am definitely torn. Um, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and, and what the ramifications are for the young men that played on that team. Um, and first of all, before we, you know, before we dive into the topic, let me just say that, you know, I salute, respect, and honor the, uh, the kids and the young men that played on the Jackie Robinson West uh, baseball team. Your accomplishments will stand. They speak for themselves. You guys did nothing wrong. Um, and, and that's probably the saddest fact out of all of this is that the children suffer for any improprieties or mistakes that the adults made. Um, if, if we play this by the letter of the law and we examine the rules, the rules were broken. The punishment is correct. It, 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 it wasn't it, it by the letter of the law, what, ha- what, what happened was correct. Those, those right. kids that played on that team outside of that district, um, you read the rule book, the rule is clear, you, 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 you can play it by the letter of the law. I always and, and, say and, that there's got to be – oh, go ahead, Doug. Go ahead. No, I was about to say, and, and you know what the adults or coaches or management of that team actually did – was falsify a boundary map that they showed to Little League International. Um, and the thing was, they never got permission from the other clubs in Chicago to do that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and right. they tried to go back to these clubs right. after winning the Little League World Series to try to get them on board and to, to basically lie for them after they – did this behind their backs without their permission. So, you know, that that's right. the, the adults part in this. But like you said, yeah, the, the, the kids are, are getting a raw deal yeah. because of the some kids. overzealous adults who take little league sports yeah. way too seriously. Way too serious. Yeah. So and that that's where I'm kind of torn a little bit because I feel like if if you take these these kids and I believe they were in what what was the age range, Dev? What was the age range of the team? Uh what what is the little league? I don't know. Keep going, but I'll I'll, I'll find it for you. Oh, yeah. If if it's if it's kids that are let's say t- uh 10, 11 to 12, right? Yeah, I think I think they're and like yeah, mostly like 12 year old. You 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 bring in a kid that's 15. That's six Danny Almonte. Yeah. 14, you are given a competitive and athletic advantage. You are given a competitive and athletic advantage over the 10, 11, and 12-year-olds that you're playing against. I feel as though that is the epitome of cheating, right? Right. The kids that were brought onto this team from other locations were not older. They were not in a different class. They were not, you know, they may have been athletically superior. I mean, we saw the results, but it wasn't from any age disparity. So no, it was just superior it's not athletes. as if kids were, you know, it, 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 it wasn't as if it was unfair competition. I'll say that it wasn't unfair competition. So to me, in my mind, they, and weren't, just they how weren't age I, ringers. They weren't age yeah, ringers. The, the, the way that I look at cheating in sports is unfair competition. And so when something is not unfair, it's hard for me to reconcile it as cheating. But you, you got to look like, at it. I, we got to look at it this way, though, B, because earlier I, I mistakenly mm-hmm. said falsifying addresses. They actually didn't falsify addresses. They just drew yeah. on a map Boundary. some boundaries that didn't exist. So right. if you know right. that, you know, this Barry Bonds-like kid lives in this district up here, then, right. you know, your pen is going to go, is going to trace your a little line a little, little bit farther up so you can get that kid. Right. So you have to think about it like as another as a coach of a rival team in Chicago or or, or one of the players of, right. of rival teams. You're thinking like, OK, the, the Barry Bonds kid and, and 
and and that Ken Griffey like kid over there, they they live in our district. So, right. you know, we going to have these dudes. But then you got to play against them on this super team and and you're getting wiped by a team where some of their players should be playing with you. Like the whistleblower on this whole thing right. was a, was a coach of a team that got beat 43 to 2 by these teams. And, and when I saw that, I was a little dumbfounded because I'm like, you know, I don't believe in the whole coddle thing, but I thought there yeah. were rules in like little league sports where scores aren't going to get to 43 to two in baseball. I mean, I remember mercy rules when I played little league football, like we used to smack teams right. around and they called a game after like a four touchdown lead or something like that. How do you get to 40, right. 43 to two? But that's besides the point. Like you're getting wiped by this team and you're looking over there like, yo, that dude, and that dude and that dude are supposed to be playing on this team. Like, how are they legally over there? And then you That's find out later that this dude falsified the boundaries. So I get what you're saying. It's definitely not the same as like bringing in Danny Almonte, who was like 16 um, when the when the Bronx got their wins uh, in the Little League World Series stripped away from them um, through a perfect game and everything. But. At the same time, like you said, if you go by the letter of the law and these little league sports have some strict letters of the law, then you can be upset. But it's it's difficult for me to be upset with Little League International when they were only doing what they had to do. Now, you said right. you pulled it. You know me. I keep my race cards a little tight to the vest, and you usually do as well. I, you know, I ain't gonna put you out there like that because we think the same way. We actually think a lot of us play them when they don't need to be wait, played. Wait, but wait. I, I actually think that this is one where where you throwing your race, where people are throwing their race card out with a weak hand because I'm not naive. Now I want everybody out here to listen because you know black black people don't like when you don't throw your race card at the same time they're throwing theirs. I'm not right. naive at all. I'm not saying that there isn't anyone at Little League International. I'm not saying that there's not anyone who played in the Little League World Series, who coached against these guys or 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 have anything to do with this situation. I'm not saying that there aren't some people out there fist pumping right now because that black team got their title stripped from them. I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying that there's not a person or people like that within the halls of Little League International. But by the letter of the rule, the adults cheated. There's nothing else they can do but strip the title. So for everybody to go on and saying, oh, well, they did this because that black team won or this is a witch hunt for the black team. I, I, I don't I don't buy that because a lot of people that I've spoken to are putting it on the whistleblower like oh this is just somebody that's salty but i'm like okay if you got beat by a team and they weren't on the up and up why wouldn't you be salty like what's the big deal of somebody being salty and and basically pursuing what they know to be true and what an investigation turned up to support no so i so no, for I, me I, like i, I can't I, buy the the the, the I, black I team that. witch hunt but I know there's some people I, happy I get because that. of that. I, I get that, and I agree with your position completely. It's just understand context, man. Understanding where the city of Chicago is and what that team meant to the city of Chicago and the youth, and the and even the some of the some of the backstories around, you know, the players, some of the players being homeless, living in shelters, like all of that stuff. It kind of just made me feel like damn, where's the compassion and empathy yeah. for the kids? Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, again, if you're playing it by the letter of the law, I, I also asked the question that, you know, had they lost, would a stink been made? You know, had they lost, not not before they got to the championship, but when they got to the championship, if they lost the chip, would the stink have been made? And then if it there, were there's precedence a for that, different though. team. A, okay. I'm, I'm not saying there aren't. I'm just asking the questions because I don't follow Little League. If like I said, that, a, that team a, that I named earlier another, with Danny Monte and the, the Bronx team, they didn't win mm -hmm. any championships. And they still got their okay. stuff stripped because people pressed the issue. But Okay. So, okay. I mean, but but anybody who want to pull a card could say, okay, he was a minority as well. So, so I mean, right. there's always a card right. to be pulled if you choose to pull it, but. 
Right. I mean, for me, so I don't better know. Alone. I just I'm, I'm just saying you can't blame Little League for this. If you want to say, going, I think going, involved, of course, they're salty. Going, going forward, I think my position on all of this is, damn, the kids. I feel bad right. for the kids. So that could translate to they were there, the adults supervising and coaching their program made some very, very poor decisions and cheated. So you could blame it on them. You could say Little League could have had some more compassion for team. You could you could say a whole bunch of things, but at the end of the day, that the kids that played ultimately lose. So that's, that's definitely my opinion. And, and that's who I feel for the most in this situation. And that's what right. I, and that's what I'm saying. I, I I was in a few conversations where it seems like because I wasn't willing to throw out that card, then I didn't have compassion for the kids. But the kids is, are the ones that. I'm thinking about the most on this right. because I guarantee you, could, you, you that the kids knew that. nothing of what's going on. Even if their right. parents knew this dude was, you know, making these boundary lines a little, you know, exaggerated. Right. The kids, the kids probably yeah. still don't know. The kids just know mom, dad, you know, get my cleats and, and my bat and my and, and my uniform because I'm going out here to play. And let me go like, to work. They don't know yeah. about that. So and you know and you know you know the bad the, the the other side to this that you could play in response to the race card is if you let it stand and you let it go, then the message that you're telling the kids is that it is okay to cheat. It is okay to break right. the rules. It is okay. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I mean I mean you know we, we talk ways. about this all the time, B. Like a lot of times our people don't hold our people accountable. We always want to give excuses. We always want to you know, get, like, how is that going to make people better if, you know, nobody's right. holding them accountable? If you, you know, I, that's just that's my thoughts on it. I mean, of course, we've seen injustices in this country, in this world where it was absolutely a, a black thing. And, and and that's the reason why something was going down. And and like I said earlier, I want to repeat this for people who, who just, you know, got on the radio, just started listening to us. I in no way am naive enough to think that there's nobody in Little League and all around the league, outside, whatever, that aren't out there fist pumping because this all black team got their title stripped. But if you go by the letter of the law, there was nothing else Little League International could do. So um, shout out to those kids, though, because it's like what we talk about all the time. We talked about the whole Reggie Bush thing and, and Michigan uh, Fab Five and their wins and stuff like that. You can strip what you want to strip. But we saw it happen. <laughs> Nobody's going to tell us that they weren't the champions this year. Nobody's going to tell me that Reggie Bush didn't win a Heisman some years back. So, you know, do what you got to do because of your laws and your rules and your morality but and your integrity. But we, we, we saw what happened and we saw what the, what the young boys did. All right. I, um, we, I, I want to talk about two, two incidences that happened this week where sports figures – basically kind of got fed up with somebody harassing them either through social media email and and actually had an exchange of of words and you know we got to kind of do this quickly because we're going to have Kamal Hilton uh uh who covers the Toronto Raptors on with us in a in a few minutes to talk some basketball but RG3 got into an exchange of words on Instagram with a quote unquote fan and James Dolan, the owner of the New York Knicks got fired on in an email by, I believe it was like a 73 year old fan. And he went back at the dude with five, six guns blazing. So let's talk about the RG three thing real quick. He posted a video on Instagram of him driving, supposedly driving to, you know, to, to train. And he was listening to Michael Jackson. He was singing along to Michael Jackson and a fan basically started to get on him on his Instagram page about not really being serious and not really being a leader and, and saying that he cares more about his brand than, than being great at his craft or actually being a leader. Now I think the person made some, I think he made some valid points, but I just think that the context of where he made these points. I think it really didn't make much sense. Like if you just wanted to go on Robert for that, I don't think him posting a video on Instagram of him singing Michael Jackson on the way to work 
was what should prompt an attack like this. You know what I'm saying? Because we've all questioned his his um you know we've all questioned his level of of I don't know just what he wants out of the game because we we see him in plenty of commercial and it might be a little unfair because we 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 see Andrew Luck and he doesn't really do commercials and he said that he wants to concentrate on his craft and that's the guy that he's always going to be most compared to. So we 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 question Robert's dedication because we see him in so many things and he's just out there trying to get his money. Um, but at the same time, he's struggling on the football field. So that never looks good to fans. So what do you think about the whole Instagram exchange? Because he actually started talking to the guy and asking him, you know, he, he started throwing some things out there. Like if I'm training and I'm giving back to the community at the same time, why is that frowned upon? You know, he, he started blowing his own horn a little bit. So what did you yeah. think when you when you read the conversation? I thought the fan um, made some very, very valid points about Bob Norbit. Um, and I thought that I see you, you, you said, well, in that situation and on that platform, why pull the grenade and throw it? Why pull the pin and throw the grenade? You know, I, I get that. But if you look at the history and where it's coming from, if that is a true fan of the Washington professional football team, I understand completely him taking the time right then to express his feelings on social media in that format. And, and the fan was not disrespectful. He was a little stern, he was a little harsh, but he wasn't disrespectful. He didn't call, you know, out of and uh, say anything irrational, disrespectful. He didn't call uh, Bob Norbit out of his name as I am. Um, you know, he was he was respectful. He just made some points that were absolutely on point because here's the thing about the way athletes and branding works today. We all know what branding is. We all know what marketing is. We all know what social media is used for. So much of what today's athlete does is about influencing people they're following via social media because it's a platform that we all use and it makes those people feel as if they can relate even more to that specific athlete or celebrity. So this guy is saying this particular little Instagram post in and of itself, of course, Bob Norbert could have the responses he had because that self-contained in a vacuum, I would agree with you, Dev. It has nothing to do with anything. So why would you use that? But if you this take is... from the time he was drafted until mm -hmm. today, if a fan is observing him, this is just one more small needle on a haystack. And it was that that broke the camel's back for that particular fan. Here this right. dude is. I hear about stuff with him every month, in season, off season, uh, during training, whatever it is, I hear about these things all the time. And I see them because no matter what, it, no matter what uh, 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 coaching staff is there, no matter what is told to him, no matter what criticisms he he does the same things over and over and over and over again. So this is just one more thing as a fan that I'm going at. I mean, I know that you may be doing something positive. You may be going to work out with your receivers, but here you are on social media. We know your audience are following and haters and critics are going to observe. And you're stirring the pot. I think and it's you, kind of something like, like you alluded to, B, is I, I think like with this fan, it might be a, the type of thing where he sees everything that he doesn't like. And he probably was at his breaking point. Like, if I see one more thing from this guy, you know what right. I'm saying? And he saw one more thing, even though this was something that probably shouldn't have spurred this particular conversation. He just got tired of seeing the guy because, you know, right. He can go back. There are plenty of tweets, Instagram posts, Facebook posts from Robert Griffin where you could actually say the things that this guy was saying. But in this particular scenario and context, his his criticism really made no sense. It made sense on a, a broader, uh, you know, in the broader, broader scheme of things. Broader, broader. But yeah, yeah. But, as, but as far as why he came at him this time, I'm like, yo, he's just singing Billie Jean. He, he wasn't. <laughs> doing anything like he usually does to draw uh negative Yo, type Andrew Luck, attention to him. If Andrew Luck comes on and sings Billy Jean, we clap him because he's Andrew Luck. 
but you're Bob Norbit and you're always on here. You're on social media more than we're on social media. Nah, dog. Be quiet. Go throw passes to your receivers and stop standing lonely by yourself, punting the ball to yourself and running and catching it. Your quarterback. Okay. Come on, man. Hey, and and um and uh Kamal, if you're if you're on the line, make sure you press one so we know that that's you. Um let, let, you know, let's talk about the other story where um <laughs> somebody got into it with a fan. Like I said, James Dolan basically tells a fan off in an email. Now, the fan, Irvin Beerman, uh, he's like a 52-year Nick fan. What he said in the actual um email to james dolan it didn't it didn't necessarily like it it's not that it wasn't true but you know he came at him a, a little bit sideways so you have to expect from at least from a human being you might not expect it from the owner of the new york knicks you might expect him to just you know shake it off but at the same time these dudes are human and they they're human. Yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a breaking point. You know what I'm saying? So the guy said to him, he said, uh, at one stage, I thought that you did a wonderful thing when you acquired everything from your dad. However, since then, it's been all downhill. You're working with Isaiah Thomas and everything else regarding the Knicks. Bringing on Phil Jackson was a positive beginning, but lowballing Steve Kerr was a disgrace to the Knicks. The bottom line is that you merely continue to interfere with the franchise. Um, and this is what he said to him. Uh, he says, as a Knicks fan for an excess of 60 years, I'm utterly embarrassed by your dealings with the Knicks. Sell them so their fans could at least look forward to growing them in a positive direction. Obviously, money is not the only thing. You have done a lot of utterly stupid business things with the franchise. Please no more. Respectfully, Irvin Beerman. So he didn't go too hard on James Dolan. I mean, you throw the word stupid in there in any context and, and it's going to get somebody's antenna. up. So he responded to him. He said, why would anybody write such a hateful letter? I am just guessing, but I'll bet your life is a mess. He hit him with the LeBron John. Like, you got to go back to your miserable life. He said, I'm just guessing, but I mm. bet your life is a mess and you are a hateful mess. What you have done, what have, I'm sorry, what have you done that anyone would consider positive or nice? I am betting nothing. In fact, I'll bet you're a negative force in everyone who comes in contact with you. You most likely have made your family miserable, alcoholic maybe. I just celebrated my 21 year anniversary of sobriety. You should try it. Maybe it will help you become a better person that folks would like to have around. In the meantime, uh, he said you should start rooting for the Nets because the Knicks don't want you. Respectfully, James Dolan. My thing is, OK, like like we just spoke about people have their breaking points. And I, I don't even know mm -hmm. because I've gotten much worse in emails, uh, mm -hmm. Facebook. Twitter. Lord knows <laughs> we've gotten much worse. And there's been some things that we fire back about. But I think they were a little more personal than what the dude said here. I think this might be a situation where a longtime Knicks fan held a mirror up to you and you didn't like the image in that mirror. Maybe he shouldn't have used you know, terms like stupid and, and, and things like that. But does that prompt you even if you're going to answer him and even if you're going to fire back, does that prompt you to just assume that the dude's an alcoholic to assume that he's made his family's life miserable and, and stuff like that? Like Yo, that's where I think he, he, he stepped over the line. Dolan was out of pocket, out of line <laughs> and not dignified in his response from us because we fire back. <laughs> yeah. And, and we shoot back. We definitely, we look forward to shoot. We come in the social media. If you're listening, with guns in holsters, looking for the next victim. But in this particular case, the guy didn't say, take any personal shots. He took no personal shots. He kept it basketball. So for you to assume and throw out there about alcoholism, that's in very poor taste, man. That's in very poor taste. So James Doolin, he, 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 he witched up. He witched up with that response. He showed the world that he is cognizant of the fact that he's failing. It hurts his feelings when people tell him that he's failing. And he reached a breaking point and he blew. He blew off steam. And he, and dude happened to be the one standing there when Doolin fired his six guns back. That's what it boils <laughs> down to. All right. So James Dolan, in the words of Cameron Giles, you mad. 
<laughs> you mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I know you we've uh, we haven't handed out any of these tonight, and some more people probably deserve oh. them. But James Nolan, you are oh, the yeah. owner of the New York Knickerbockers, a team that's in the top two, usually the number one team in revenue every single year. So you should probably you should be ashamed. All right, and before we get into this NBA talk and talk a little bit with uh, Kamal Hilton um, of NBA Nation Australia and War Room Sports, um, let me give you guys our stat of the week. And keeping with the, the James Dolan theme, our stat of the week is the fact that the New York Knicks um, hasn't won a playoff series. I'm sorry, they've won one playoff series in the past 14 years. And this is the type of stuff that fans complain about. This is why fans are upset. So, you know, James Dolan should probably chill a little bit on worrying about getting back at them and worry about uh, improving the Knicks, who by most accounts are a historical franchise. So, yeah, one playoff series win in the last 14 years. That's a crazy stat considering you're firing back at fans and telling them they should go root for the Nets. All right, so let's let's get into some some basketball talk and before we do, you guys, you know you can check out our website worldsports.com. Uh to call in and speak with us about any of today's topics, dial the Digital Extreme Tech hotline at numbers 323-410-0012, just press 1 when prompted. But if you're already listening from your phone, just go ahead and press 1. If you want to talk. All right. And this NBA rap, including Kamal Hilton segment, is brought to you by Fanatics. For the best in your favorite team's merchandise and apparel, shop Fanatics. Shopping Fanatics is easy. Just go to our site, worldroomsports.com, and click on the Fanatics logo or on our main page. Um, you can also go to our sponsors page and get the latest in NFL, NBA, NHL, MLB, NCAA gear and more um you guys know we usually do the nba players of the week first but since we do have a guest waiting on the line we're going to go to him first um kamal's a, a an nba writer he covers the toronto raptors but like i've been telling you guys all week on social media he, he covers the entire nba as well especially you know when teams come to toronto he just doesn't talk to the raptor players he talks to everybody and and gets the scoop and may, and has great interviews and 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 writes great articles and columns um about what he sees and and the people that he talks to um he he writes for nba nation australia um he writes a weekly column on mb i'm sorry on warroomsports.com called nba quick takes so uh you guys might know him because he's also our correspondent on North American soccer. That's one of his expertise, but he's he, he's spreading his wings and, and, and doing it on the basketball tip a little now. So I'd like to welcome Kamal to the show. Kamal, what's going on? You're in the war room. Uh, hey, Dad. Hey, B. Austin. How's it going? Pretty good. Kamal, right, what's good, bro? All-star good. break is here. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm happy. It's here, actually. It's actually good that it's a, a little extended this year, just because, yeah. uh, you know, covering, a, although I enjoy covering a lot of the games, it's a lot of games, so it's good right. to have a little True. bit of a break. True, a little break. Yeah. Man, we and all I know, need it. I know Woo. a lot of the... Yeah, I know a lot of the players think feel the same way that you do because there's so many nagging injuries going around where people are missing games here and there, and then you know, so many people actually having to drop out of the All Star game because of injury. So this extended, uh, you know, All Star break could do a lot of players some good. But look, man, let's let's get right into it because you know what we want to know from you since you know you 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 cover the league. Um, you get to see a lot of teams uh, come through there in Toronto, the the, the Air Canada Center. Um, you get to see a lot of players. Give us some of your top observations from the first half of the season um, from around the league. Um, we'll get into the Toronto Raptors after we talk about the rest of the league. But what are some of your observations, maybe some surprising ones, or you know, just maybe some things that you expected to go down 
during the first half of the season. Okay, well, I think everybody uh, knows about the Atlanta Hawks by now. I think they caught everybody mm-hmm. off guard, so I'd probably put them to one side. But uh, I guess the team that maybe surprised everybody, including me, and I don't really like them because – their city is boring, but the Milwaukee Bucks, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a team that like really shocked me with how young they are and how they're playing, and really they just took spare parts and like rejects from other teams and put them together, and you know I don't like how Jason Kidd left Brooklyn, but it looks like a smart move after all. But uh, right. yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Milwaukee for what they what they did because they're right. actually like, a good defensive team right and like you said they you know they've taken scraps from other teams but you know they have some nice young talent and i think well i don't think anybody had expectations for the milwaukee bucks this year but i think when jabari parker got hurt people definitely expected the team to fall off and i think since that time they what have they gone maybe like 16 and 11 or something like that since he's been injured so yeah, they're they're definitely holding they're, their own they're, right now. They're holding on to the sixth spot in the league with a thirty and twenty three record. So I would agree with them all that this is definitely a story that people need to pay attention to, and it's one of the better stories um, of the first half of the shout season. Out to, uh, shout out to Jason Kidd on the job that he's doing coaching uh, the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, Giannis. I'm not gonna pronounce his I last name. Say, call that dude G A. Takumpo. G A. All right. So <laughs> that yeah, that dude um, is on his way to stardom. I mean, the athleticism is out of this world. Obviously, defensively, he's already becoming a, a, a terror. And when he puts the offensive pieces together. Scary, very think, scary. But think about this. But yeah, so shout I mean, out to they the they would have to have a major collapse not to keep this playoff spot. I mean, they're they're seven games in front of Charlotte, who's the next seed, who's the seventh seed in the in the Eastern Conference playoff hunt right now. So it would well, have to be to something playoffs. major. Yeah, it, it would have to be a major collapse for them not to go to the playoffs. They're not yeah, going to do anything about, in the playoffs, but they're going. Yeah, like think about. Even is not just Jabari Parker they lost. They lost Larry Sanders with his issues. They lost mm-hmm. Brandon Knight for a little bit. They lost. They they've lost like when when they came to play um, Toronto, they had like five or six guys out, and OJ Mayo got ejected in the game, and they still won. Oh God, he's still in the league. <laughs> Scrappy bunch. <laughs> Orange yeah. juice and mayonnaise. But but Kamal, you, you said, you know, you mentioned the Atlanta Hawks earlier, and everybody does know, you know, about that story. The the win streak that they went on, you know, put them on people's radar if they weren't already on the radar. But I think this is another team, even though they made the playoffs last year, I think this is a team that nobody had big expectations for. Now they're leading the um the Eastern Conference with a 43 an 11 record. I mean, they have 43 wins, which is actually the most in the NBA. Uh, the Warriors are just better by the loss column. But um, what do you owe Atlanta success to? I mean, they're starting five, just one NBA player of the month. I, I wasn't too cool with a, 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 a an individual war going to a whole team. But the fact that they were bold enough to make that statement and do that just shows you what this team – is doing right now like do you think they can keep it up in the second half of the season i really hope so they're i'm fully on board this train this atlanta hawks train i want them to make the finals they're 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 fun to watch man i mean when they again when they came to toronto they blew us out by like halftime and it was it was like (laughs) it was ugly in terms of the score the scoreboard but they're a fun team to watch. I attribute their success. I guess you attribute it to Coach Popovich because he had <laughs> Coach Bud on his staff for like 19 right. seasons. But uh, yeah, it's just the fact that their main strength is they don't have any stars. Like usually, 
you know, with a team, you know who the go-to guy is. On this team, the go-to guy is right. the guy with the ball. Right. They're very and legit. Even, They're very even, legitimate. And it might not even be the guy with the ball because you have Kyle Korver, who's better without the ball than with the ball if you watch how he moves. Right. Court. Well, you know, we've, um, yeah, we 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 have experience because Kyle Corver started his career in Philadelphia and, and we root for the 76ers. We're hoping that, you know, once they get some real talent on this team and, and even the guys that they have now, you know, you can see these young guys improving. Um, but we're hoping that since we have a, a, a Popovich uh, disciple as coach, we hope we can be the Atlanta Hawks and and. <laughs> In, in the years to come, hopefully sooner rather than later. But um, I, before I like, we move like on Brett to, Brown. huh? I like I like Brett Brown. I think uh, I think he has those guys playing hard, and that was a big win for the Sixers against uh, Golden State. I I, I do oh, as yeah. well. Like I've been trying to sell B Austin on it because it's hard to see how good of a coach somebody is when they lose every night. But I, <laughs> I keep trying to tell them, like, you know, when you're when you're watching Sixers games and you're watching any type of foot footage on that team right now, as a fan, you know, you start to watch everything because you don't expect to get wins night in and night out. So you start watching and you start listening more to what the coach has to say and what his philosophies are. And, and I think, you know, once they get him the right talent, I, I think he'll be a very good coach as well. My, but before uh, we get into yeah, my, I'll go ahead, B. I'm sorry. I was going to say my eyes gloss over uh, on the Sixers because I literally see the sabotage. Like, as bad as they are, they're actually good enough to win some games that they have lost. Um, and, and I see the sabotage, so I, I can't even I can't even think past next week, let alone I, you know, I credit the overall that to him, strategy. I credit, I credit that yeah. to the coach, B, because if you look at the roster, they're actually not good enough to win any games, but they have yeah, won yeah. some. But come on, um, before we talk Hulk, about expectations, amazing. hold up. Before we talk about expectations for the second half of the season, did you have any more points about the any more observations from the first half? Or did you want to move uh, on? Hmm. I, well, I guess we could talk a little bit about Cleveland. Um, oh yeah, I do like the moves they made minus J.R. Smith. I, I like the Mozgov move. I like the uh, Shumpert move. Uh, JR's balling, though. Uh, I don't like him. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> he said, nah, nah. I'm not a fan of his. He, he'll, he'll destroy the team. Uh, maybe not this year, but like if he stays there, he's going to destroy the team. I don't like J.R. Smith. But Cleveland, okay. Cleveland, I expect them to move up, move up in the standings and – uh, yeah. when they were going on the on that run, when they like eleven or twelve games, uh, they can be a scary team for sure. Yeah, they seem to have caught their stride. You know, reminiscent of the the first year LeBron was with the Heat, lost some games early. Everybody got down on them, and then you know they showed you why they got together in the first place. All right, so. Uh, um, and we could start with them as far as expectations for the second half of the season because they actually finish, uh, you know, the first half. We like to say half, even though it's more than half. But they finish before the All-Star break with three, I would call, three impressive wins. Um, what do you see from the Raptors moving forward? And and then you could talk about, you know, any other expectations you have for um, the NBA in general for the rest of the season. Uh, I like what the Raptors have done lately. They seem to, uh, they're, they're kind of in and out with their defense. Like when they were on their losing streak, they, uh, they had, they were like funky defensively, but they seem to have caught on. Like you said, uh, the three big wins before the all-star break against the Clippers, the Spurs and the Wizards, uh, those are huge, but we'll know more about this Raptors team after the All-Star break because they go on the road for four games. They have to play the Hawks again, who kick the crap out of them in, in <laughs> near Canada Center. They, they, they have to play the Rockets. They have to play the Pelicans, who 
They lost to with a Tyreek Evans game winner. And then you have to play the Mavs, which is a tough team. Mm, well, that's a well, tough road team. trip. And then you come back home and you guess who you have to play? Golden State. Jeez. Yeah, so we're going to learn about the Raptors for sure. But I like I like Jonas Valanciunas. I think uh, they need to use him more in certain spots, but he's really developing into a go-to guy for the for the Raptors and uh getting DeMar DeRozan back from injury was huge. They dealt with it, they dealt with that injury well, but uh right. getting him back is a big deal and then Kyle Lowry, he's an all-star for a reason. I know you guys like him cuz he's a Philly guy. But yeah. uh yeah. PSP, Philly support Philly, but even, you know, even without our Philly biases, you know, he, he deserves to be there. Um, I'm, we're still shocked, though, that even though he's playing as well as he is, we're still shocked that the fans actually voted him in. Like, I, I would have never expected that. I don't know about that, because if you if you if well, watching the Raptor games and being around the city, uh, there is a huge push every game and like trying to get him in and like during the the games they would have their little voting thing and just try to get 10,000 votes uh by the end of the game or by the beginning of the fourth quarter and they would always get 10,000 votes every game so so probably like 90% of his votes probably came from city of toronto <laughs> yeah <laughs> and like then getting them in there every I, game. I, was, I was listening to your show didn't uh Jimmy say like DeRozan and Valanchunas was up in the voting as they well. were high in the vote. Yeah. yeah. So so it definitely yeah. makes sense. But even if that's the case, it he deserves it. You know, I think I thought he should have been an all-star last year. But you know, yeah, fans outside of Toronto didn't really oh. recognize what he was doing. Um tough hard nosed guard. All right. So before we get you out of here, I know who you want to make it to the finals. Is is that your prediction, or you know, give us your picks for the finals? Is it the guys that you want to be in there, Atlanta versus San An, or do you have a different pick? Who do I think? Who do I? <laughs> I am going to say I'm sticking with it. You know what? I'm going to stick with it. Okay. San Antonio cool. and Atlanta. It's it just Antonio, I'm a basketball man. nerd, and that's that's the type of game that I like to see terms of coaching it's like a chess match but the nba won't like it because there won't be any lebron james or anything right like that. and and you know and it's well documented especially in your nba quick takes column that you would rather see the nba go to a format of top 16 teams regardless of conference um i wouldn't leave the east much because right now we're talking about san antonio making the finals it a seventh seed in the West at thirty four and nineteen. <laughs> they would be better than the. There would be two teams better than that yeah. in the East right now. And that's Atlanta and your Toronto Raptors. Everybody else would be under the Spurs. It would be interesting. I mean, we would get some great matchups in the first round and throughout the playoffs. So they really should take that in, into consideration. But Kamal. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, thanks for your, your column weekly because it's it's actually, you know, you've only done a few, but it's gaining steam. It's getting a lot of readership. Um, so all your hard work is is getting noticed in different parts of the globe because you got the Aussies out there, NBA Nation, Australia. You know, you're up, in the, up north of the border in Canada, and, you know, we're going to try to spread your work around as much as we can down here in the u.s so we appreciate your hard work man and everybody you can catch tomorrow come all on uh twitter at kamal hilton um that's hilton with a y h-y-l-t-o-n um you can catch his his weekly column nba quick takes on warroomsports.com and you can catch uh, his coverage of the toronto raptors and the rest of the nba at nba australia.com um get you some rest <laughs> over the all-star break and definitely 
Yeah, and and we'll we'll talk to you next week, man. We appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Thank you guys for having me. And whenever you guys want me on Court Vision, just let me know. Oh, no doubt. No we'll doubt. definitely be getting you on Court no Vision. Doubt. So uh, stay tuned for that, everybody. You also catch. You also will be able to catch Kamal on WarRoomSportsTV.com. But thanks again, bro. And we will speak to you soon. Uh, for sure. Have a good Thank night. You, Kamal. You too. All right, that's Kamal Hilton, everybody, of NBA writer for War Room Sports and NBA Nation Australia.com. Covers the Toronto Raptors up there in the Air Canada Center. Um, B, let's let's talk a little because we got to give our picks, man. We I know we we always give our our picks for All-Star Weekend, but before we do that, we 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 got to give props to the NBA players of the week because we spoke about one of them earlier. And that's um, Giannis Antetokounmpo. I think I might have gotten that right. But um, shout out to you the did. homie, the mayor, on uh, <laughs> on uh, After Further Review, also on the World's Podcast Network. I was listening to his show the other day, and he was like me. Usually, I don't even try these type of names. He said, we're just going to call him GA on After Further Review. And I think we're going to have to follow suit here in the war room, just call him GA. Um, but he was the Eastern Conference Player of the Week, along with Russell Westbrook for the Western Conference. Uh, GA shot 63.3% from the field. Um, he scored 19.5 points per game, 11 rebounds per game, and 1.7 blocks per game. Um, and the uh, Milwaukee Bucks, who we talked about us being so surprised about, um, I believe they went – what was their record last week? I can't even find their record. Well, they had a good week because he won. They were three and one uh, during the week. Um, and this second year kid from Greece is is really making a name for himself in the league. Uh, Russell Westbrook averaged thirty four point three points um, <laughs> per game, nine point three rebounds, and nine assists, and two and a half steals. Um, as the Thunder went three and one, they're starting to pick up some steam because you know we keep questioning whether or not they're going to make the playoffs. I think. With no more injury, of course, I think they're full steam ahead and going to end up getting that that uh, that a spot. What do you think? Yeah, I got it happening. I got it yeah. happening. All right, well, shout out to GA and shout out to Rob Brook for uh, becoming NBA Players of the Week. And we also want to give a shout out to Spurs coach Greg Popovich for getting his thousandth win. He's the ninth coach in NBA history to, to reach that plateau. I'm pretty sure a lot of the other guys on that list <laughs> don't have five championship rings to go with it. Um, I think there may be one on the list that does, and that's that's uh, Phil Jackson. But um, shout out to, to Coach Pop. Let's talk a little bit about All-Star Weekend, man. And the first thing, I have to ask you about this. And I know we don't have that much time, and we got to make our picks, but I have to ask you about this because this is actually – the first quote unquote event of the weekend. And I know you didn't want me to ask you about this Why? on here, but the, the stars will compete in the NBA's first ever all-star fashion show. Fashion has taken over the league. And we see, like you said earlier, you know, these guys wearing these feminine outfits and stuff like that. All right. James Harden, Clay Thompson, DeMarcus Cousins. Those are just three of the names that are going to compete in the fashion show. It's produced by LeBron James's Spring Hill Production Company. Um, so I don't know if LeBron's going to be in it or not since he has a stake in, you know, the, the financial windfall that he'll probably get from this. Um, but it's going to be a one-hour NBA All-Star, All-Style fashion show, which is going to be taped Friday night inside the uh, Hammerstein Theater. And it's going to air Saturday at 6.30 um, on TNT, so it's going to air before All Star Saturday night. It's going to have three rounds: dressing for the boardroom, a night out, and attire worn to the game. The competition is going to have eight players, with four advancing to the second round, and the top two competing in the finals. Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith, and some WNBA players, uh, Ella, Elena Della Don, are going to be on the judging panel. What are your thoughts on this, B. Austin? Are you? 
Uh, in the words of Kendrick Lamar, as I take them out of context, new ninjas, just new ninjas. I don't get involved. Um, <laughs> nah, I don't get involved. Man. Uh, so we got guys that won't participate in the dunk contest, but they'll walk on the catwalk and compete. Against you are gay. And see, who, and see who can model best. We want to know who's a better model. Yeah. Um, we got my man uh, Dwight Howard grabbing people's um, penises Go on next. live TV <laughs> and wrong with wearing uh, a a tire that would fit on the fashion show. Um, Jason Collins came out. I mean, they're looking for more players to come out. I, it's really not my thing. I really, I can't really, you know, I I can't relate. I don't understand. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't really, I'm at a loss here. I'm Just not able to. Every, everybody in the world. All right, we got approximately four minutes. So we got to do our all star picks on rapid fire. So let's start with the uh, first event, the first meaningful event, uh, the Friday night, the, the BBVA Compass Rising Stars Challenge, also known as the rookie game. That's what we used to call it. Or, you know, it became the rookies versus sophomores. And now they're fiddling with. Uh, a, a different format where it's going to be uh, the young players from the U S versus the young players from around the world. So it's basically going to be like the old hockey all-star format. So let me give you the rosters of both teams and I'm just going to get your winner, the team winner and your MVP. So for the U S roster, we got Trey Burke from the jazz uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope from the Pistons, Robert Covington from the 76ers. Shout out to Robert Covington because he's one of those D League signees who's just absolutely balling um, for a bad team. Zach Levine from the Timberwolves, Shabazz Muhammad from the Timberwolves, Nerlens Noel from the Sixers, uh, Victor Oladipo from the Magic, Alfred Payton from the Magic, Mason Plumley from the Nets, Cody Zeller from the Hornets. Uh, then you got. Uh, Michael Carter Williams from the Sixers and the head coaches. Don't he won't play. He coach. won't. Michael Carter Williams won't play. He's injured. Yeah, that's a, his name. They don't even have him highlighted anymore. Um, so the world team roster: Giannis Antetokounmpo from the Bucks, <laughs> uh, Bohan Bogdanovic from the Nets, uh, Matthew Delladova from the Cavs, Gorgi Ding f- f- Jang from the Timberwolves. Dante Exum from the Jazz, Rudy Gobert from the Jazz, Nicola Merot- M- Meritic from the Bulls. Man, this is killing me. Kostas Papanikalu. <laughs> I'm butchering these Papa names. Nikola. It's Papa Nikolai. It's Papa Nikolai. Yeah. Papa, Papa, mm-hmm. yeah, that dude. Um, Dennis Schroeder from the Hawks, Andrew Wiggins from the Timberwolves, and then they got a couple guys who won't play either. Steven Adams from the Thunder, uh, Yusuf Nurkic from the Nuggets, and Kelly Olenek from the Celtics. So who who do you have winning this one, and who do you have as your MVP? Um, I have the world team blowing out uh, the USA. Showing them where fundamentals are? Wiggins. Yeah, Andrew Wiggins is definitely – Andrew Wiggins or Dante Exum is going to yeah, go is ahead. Their, kind of Watch their, out for their, Dennis Schroeder because he's nice. I yeah, think this will be a stage for um for Andrew Wiggins to shine on. And I'm gonna go with the world team as well, but I'm gonna pick GA um to win the the MVP. I think he's gonna step in um one one step inside the free throw line and, and and get a bang. Not the free throw line, one step inside the three point line and get a crazy three bang. Point line. Yeah. Give, give it to him just off of that. Um so let's move on to the degree shooting stars and the teams. You got Team Bosch. I would never want to be a part of anything called Team Bosch. But that's um, Chris Bosch, Dominique Wilkins, and Swin Cash versus Team Curry. Uh, Steph Curry, isn't, Del Curry, uh, Sue Bird, Team Davis. Isn't Dwight Anthony Howard Davis. on Team Bosch? <laughs> 
everybody in the fashion show on Team Bosch. Team Davis, Anthony Davis, uh, Scotty Pippen, Elena Della Don, and Team Westbrook, Russell Westbrook, Anthony Hardaway, and Tamika Catchings. Which one of these teams you got winning the shooting stars? Yo, why does why do the Boschians always win it? Is that symbolic for what's going on in society? Because the last right. two years running, Chris Bosch has, has, has dominated this. I'm going to go with the Currys because I always pick the Currys. It's a shooting event. I'm not picking the game. Um, no. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Currys as well. And I think we but we only got about 90 seconds, like, period. So let's just, we, we, we can't. We just going to have to give picks. Rabbit Taco time. Bell's skills challenge. The, partic- the participants in this, uh, you got uh, Isaiah Thomas, John Wall, Trey Burke, Brandon Knight, uh, Jimmy Butler, Kyle Lowry, Michael Carter-Williams, and Jeff Teague. I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with John Wall on this one, just because he's fast enough to do the course. He might miss the jump shot. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go with Kyle Lowry. All right, the three point contest. Uh, <laughs> you got uh, Wesley Matthews, JJ Redneck, um, James Harden, and yes, I called him Redneck. Uh, Kyrie Irving, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Kyle Corver, and Marco Bellinelli. I'm gonna go with Kyle Corver taking this one home. Who you got? Uh, catch and shoot guys are interesting off the rack. It's been, for me. It's between JJ Redick, JJ Redneck, and Clay Thompson. I'm gonna go with Clay. All right. Um, and then you got the slam dunk contest. I don't even know the format this year, but you got GA, Antetokounmpo, Oladipo, Zach Levine, and Plum dunk contest if the actual um, format isn't lame. But I'm going to go with Zach Levine. I think he's going to show off who you got in this. Uh, yo, I was just about to say, I don't think Dev knows about Zach Levine. I was hoping that he didn't. Yo, <laughs> Zach Levine is not from this planet. He's from where black men originated from off of this world. I'm going with Zach Levine. Cool. And then you got the NBA All-Star game. We're already past our time, so we I don't have time to read the – you know who the, 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 the rosters West. are, even though – Yeah, the West. Just, just, just go ahead. The West is, is, is going to win. Too many Atlanta Hawks on the Eastern squad. I got the West winning as well, and I have – I got Steph Curry as the MVP. I think it's time for Steph to put on his show in New York City. No doubt. No digging. All right, right, everybody. Thanks for joining us again in the war room. Good people. Shout out to everyone in the chat room on Facebook and Twitter and all the callers who chimed in to holler at us. Uh, Special thanks to Kamal Hilton of War Room Sports and NBA Nation Australia for joining us to talk NBA basketball. Tune in next week. Same time, same place, live right here or on demand on the WRS Podcast Network for more great sports talk. Uh, we'll turn our focus to the second half of the NBA season, and we'll discuss all the other big stories in the sports world as well. So uh, until then, enjoy your week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Be sure to catch our conversations on Facebook, Twitter, and our webcast on WarRoomSportsTV.com and all our network shows on WRSPN.com. Until next time, everybody. Don't accept mediocrity and be steadfast in that war against ignorance. We will see you chumps on top. Game because the streets is a short stop. Either you're swinging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. Yes, sir.
cats, we better name us. World of sports. War Room Sports, www.warroomsports.com. What? Ain't no more to it.